our hearts might be pleasing in your sight, dear Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I am the good shepherd, says Jesus. Not the hired hand, not the hired help, not the one who runs away in times of trouble. No, I'm the good shepherd, says Jesus. I'm the one who loves you enough to lay his life down for you. I'm the good shepherd, says Jesus. And I know all y'all by name, says Jesus. It's a pretty intimate relationship we have with Jesus Christ. Knows us by name. I know you by name, and you know my voice. You hear my voice. You listen to my voice. You respond to my voice, says Jesus. I am the good shepherd. It's as if Jesus' teaching about the good shepherd blesses us on the one hand with comfort. We have this good shepherd who loves and abides with us, who knows us by name, who lays his life down for us. On the other hand, it sounds to me a little bit like an imperative. I know you by name. You hear me. You know my voice and you follow me. Both a word of comfort and a word of call. It's Jesus and Jesus' voice that leads us out of despair and worry into hope and promise. It is Jesus' voice that leads us from the darkness of our troubled world into the light of a new day. Well, this is Mother's Day, and I was thinking about one of the very first lessons I got in listening for a voice that would lead me from fear to hope, a voice that would lead me from darkness to light, the light of my salvation. And guess what? It wasn't the voice of the Lord. Not the first one. Not the first time. Now, it was a voice that taught me to listen to the, for the Lord that way, but this voice was the voice of my mother. See, it was many, many years ago. I was maybe four or five years of age. My best friend, David, called him Davy back then. Davy and I were playing in these little uh, drainage ditches that ran along the front lawns between our, our lawns and the roads that, so that when rains came, it would channel all the water away from the streets, channel them away from driveways and lawns into those ditches down the street into a drainage ditch. And the ditches had a little uh, corrugated pipes that ran underneath the driveways uh, in our neighborhood to channel the water under the driveways. But when it wasn't raining, when the weather was dry, it was a great place for a four or five year old kid to play. And this was back in a day and age where four or five year olds got to play outside and just kind of do their own thing without a whole lot of supervision. That was because every kid belonged to the whole neighborhood. Everybody kept an eye out for everybody. And I needed someone keeping an eye out for me this particular day. You see, that drainage ditch, that, that had that corrugated pipe uh, running under the, my best friend's driveway was about 17 feet long. It might have been 12 inches in diameter, maybe 16 inches. It was a really neat place to kind of uh, scooch in to, to hide when you played hide and seek or explore daddy long leg spiders or poke at those little roly poly bugs that would curl up in a ball when you touched them. How magical that was to a four or five year old kid. And those ditches were a great place for Davy and I to hang out with our matchbox toys and Tonka trucks and build kingdoms and whole worlds and cities right there in the dirt. I don't know what it was that overtook me that day, but I got this bright four or five year old idea that I should try and crawl through that corrugated pipe that ran underneath my best friend's driveway. I said, hey Davy, watch this. I'm going to crawl through that pipe. I don't remember whether Davy tried to talk me out of it or not. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't, but I went for it. I remember crawling through that tunnel, and the deeper I got into the tunnel, the darker it got. And somehow, in, in one particular moment, I panicked. I got a little fear frozen, 
and couldn't move. I was stuck. And, and in my panic, I think I tried to push myself up on my hands and knees so I could crawl out of there. Because when you're in a, a dark place, when you're stuck in a dark place, you, you just want to get out of there as quickly as possible, right? So when I pushed myself up on my hands and knees, I think I, I snagged the back of my shirt on a bolt that was holding those uh, that uh, two pieces of the pipe together to form one pipe, and I was really in it now. I was in big trouble. And so I called out. Davy! Nothing. Not at first. I, I have to tell you, I, I have suffered uh, from claustrophobia to a certain degree my whole life, and I think it originated in this one moment, stuck in that dark place. Davy! Finally, I see David's face silhouetted at the end of the tunnel, the light at the end of the tunnel, and he said, What'd you do, fatso? Get yourself stuck? <laughs> Oh, great, I'm going to deal with a lifetime of claustrophobia. Now I have to deal with fat shaming and body images for the rest of my life. I wasn't thinking anything of the sort at that time. I just wanted out of that tunnel. I said, Davey, go get my mom. I'm stuck. So Davey quickly ran across the street, got my mom. She came back really quickly. My mom panicked, of course, seeing her little baby in the, that stuck in that pipe. She said, Mark, can, can you... Can you scooch backwards? Go out backwards. I said, I can't move, Mom. I'm stuck. And she, she said, well, can you, can you try and crawl forward? I said, Mom, I'm not going anywhere. I'm stuck. And my mom, being a good mom, practiced sort of a parenting of non-anxious presence, right? She's not going to show uh, her kid the fear or the anxiety. So she took a deep breath and she said, okay, Mark, can you put your arms out in front of you like Superman? Yeah, I could do that. Superman's pretty cool. So I put my arms out in front of me. And she said, now I want you to lay on your tummy. And I want you to scooch like a, a little wiggle worm. I want you to wiggle forward. And as you do, I want you to focus on my voice. Don't listen to anything else. Not the voices in your own head. Oh, thanks for reminding me about that, Mom. I want you just to, to focus on me. Listen to my voice and scooch forward like super, uh, wiggle worm with Superman arms. And sure enough, I wiggled forward and I was able to, to get out of that little tunnel. Now, it was years later that my mother said she was panicking like you wouldn't believe inside. She said I had images of going to the nearby construction site and see if they could bring a backhoe over to dig up the driveway and get a welder to cut me out of that pipe. But it was in the listening, in the listening to her voice, that I moved in the right direction, that I had confidence and hope, and I knew which way to go. I think in some small way I was learning about what it was to be a Christian. It's to find comfort in Christ and His Word, but it's also to stay focused on His Word, to listen for it above all other voices, and to move toward that voice that leads us to that place that is good. If you're following a voice and it's not leading you to light, and it's not leading you to a place that's good, something tells me that ain't Christ's voice, is it? It's not the Word of God. No, a long time ago when I was four or five years of age, I think I was getting my early lessons about what it was to focus on the voice of comfort and to listen and follow the one that would lead me from fear into hope, that would lead me from darkness into light. Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. I know you by name and you know my voice and you follow. That's kind of what it is to be a Christian, isn't it? It's about learning to discern the Word of God in our lives, to, to learn how to listen. So I like to remind my SCAD students every now and then, God gave us two ears, one mouth. Do the math. We ought to be listening at least twice as much as we are speaking. But you have to admit, is it just me or do you experience this too? It's getting harder and harder to hear the voice of Jesus in our day and age. In our world, there are a lot of voices that are crying out for our attention today. On an hourly basis, sometimes we are bombarded with facts and alternative facts, truth and truthiness, misinformation and disinformation. 
And all those voices are crying out, listen to me, vote for me, purchase me, follow me, like me. Fill out this survey. Fill out this and you may win. You may have already won. No, the voices are, are persistent in our day and age. And if we're not careful, the voice of Jesus can get swallowed up by the buzz of our 21st century static. Do you know in the year 2010, Eric Schmidt, the former CEO of Google, was speaking at a techonomy conference in California. And he came out onto the stage uh, to address the folks at the conference, and Schmidt said that since uh, in, in the year 2010, he said, every two days, the world generates as much new information as the world has generated since the dawn of time. Every two days, he said, our world generates uh, as much information as the world has since the beginning, from cave painting to scrolls and scripts and, and uh, writing and printing and books that have been printed and sold and the number of Bibles sold. Every two days, if you amass all that, every two days, we create that much new information. But you know what's mind-boggling to me? That was 2010. That was over a decade ago. One can imagine that today, if uh, we did the research, we might discover that it's about every two hours that the world is generating that much information. <laughs> and if we're really honest, most of it kitty cat videos on Facebook or <laughs> shanty songs and new dance moves on TikTok. But it's hard to hear Jesus' voice amidst the, the barrage of voices that are coming at us all the time. And that's not even counting the swamp of rumor and gossip that comes at us every day. Well-meaning friends and colleagues who gossip about the boss or the teacher or even one another. No wonder Paul called the tongue a restless evil full of deadly poison. And even if we somehow manage to get all those external voices in check, the electronic ones, the ones in our community, the ones that are coming at us from radio and television, even if we get all those in check, we still have to somehow deal with those inner voices that are speaking to us often. We get confronted by the voice of doubt or temptation, the voice that uh, drives us to lust for power or popularity, or even celebrity, especially in our day and age. All day, every day, it seems like our ego is shouting out, feed me, Seymour. <laughs> Didn't St. Augustine said, never try and fight evil as if it's something that existed entirely apart from yourself? Quite often, it originates from within. It makes it really hard to hear the voice of Jesus. There's a wonderful old story, maybe you've heard it before. It's about a guy driving a convertible and he pulls up at a traffic light beside a big transport truck that's hauling a, a, a whole a sh a cargo load of live sheep. And the guy in the convertible shouts up to the truck driver and he says, hey, you shepherds sure lead your sheep around a lot differently than you did in biblical days. <laughs> that truck driver looks down to the guy in the convertible with a wink and a smile. He says, I'm not a shepherd. I'm a butcher. <laughs> we have to be careful, don't we? Which voice we respond to, which shepherd is leading us in this day and age. There are many voices that vie for our attention. Well, guess what? Underneath it all, underneath the buzz and the static, the cacophony of sound shouting at us, screaming at us all the time, underneath it all, there is a whisper. It's a whisper that comes to us as a small, still voice that speaks to us still. A whisper as close to us as our own breathing, as intimate to us as our own hearts beating. It's the voice of Jesus that's still speaking today, addressing your heart, addressing your life in a very personal, intimate way. I am the good shepherd. I know you by name. I'm calling out to you by name, Joella, Nancy, Don. I'm calling out to you by name. I know you, and you know my voice. It's that close. It's that intimate. When Jesus talks about 
uh, our relationship and our ability to hear him when he speaks to us. I think about Elijah who was trying to hear the word of God. Do you remember that time? He wanted to discern the word of God. He wanted to hear And he listened for God in the wind, but the word of God was not heard in the wind. And so he listened for the word of God in the earthquake, but he couldn't hear the word of God in the earthquake. And he listened for the word of God in the raging fire, but he could not hear the word of God in the raging fire. But where? Where did he hear the word of God? That's right, Bill. In the small, still voice. He withdrew into a cave, and he was still. And it was in the stillness in his active choice to do some conscious listening for the word of God in that cave, he listened and he heard that small, still voice. That is where the voice spoke to him most clearly. Sometimes I think if we can be still long enough, if we can fight that urge to be busy in our hustle culture, if we can fight that urge to check our email or scroll through our posts on Instagram, if we can just sort of put it all to the side for a moment, not forever, but for a moment. Practice those words of the old Psalm 4610, my personal mantra, because I need it the most. Be still. Be still and know that I am God. You know, it's been said it's not the notes on the page that make the music but it's the space in between. It's in the silence. It's in the stillness. It's in the pauses that we take. And we know that voice, don't we? The voice of Jesus, when we hear it, we know it distinctly above and beyond all other voices. It's not just a voice, it's the voice. It's the voice that we have known since we were uh, small children the voice we've heard whispering to us throughout our whole life, and it continues to whisper to us even now. The voice of the Good Shepherd is the voice that cuts through the static because it's different from all others. It's the voice that sometimes sounds like the cry for justice in a very brutal world that is self-driven and self-preoccupied. It's the voice that sometimes sounds like the plea for mercy in a world that's just filled with hardened hearts that desire judgment and retribution. It's the voice that leads us from regret to renewal, from discouragement and worry to comfort and hope. The voice of the Good Shepherd is the one that leads us from darkness to light when we feel stuck in that tunnel of trouble. That voice may come in a lot of different ways, but we'll hear it if we're listening. It may come as the voice of a woman who calls just to check in on her friend from time to time, her friend who's anxious or worried. That voice may come from the man on the street who pauses long enough simply to respond to the outstretched hand of need, simply to say, I see you, I hear you, God bless you. You know, a number of years ago, I had a student who did a presentation in one of my classes, and I will never forget the brilliant way she began her presentation. In fact, I wish it was my idea, because it's really brilliant, but it was hers. She began her presentation this way. She looked at us, made eye contact with each and every one of us, then she put her finger to her lips and she hushed us. She said, And when the room was as still as this room is now, she said to us, friends, I want you to listen today, but I want you to listen not with your ears, but with your hearts. Today, I want to talk to you about child poverty in America. And as she did that, it was like the little light came on for me, of course, We need to listen not with our ears, our ears that get stopped up with the noise of our generation, but with our hearts where the word of God speaks to us clearly, sometimes even as a whisper. 
Be still, says the psalm. Be still and know that I am God. You know, back in 1992, I was elected as a delegate to the 33rd General Council of the United Church of Canada, which was held in Fredericton, New Brunswick that particular year. It's like the General Assembly in the Presbyterian Church. I was really excited and eager to represent my Presbyterian General Council. And, but when I got there, I was so stunned to realize that there's as much politics in the National Church as we have in the U.S. Congress. A much, as much lobbying and division and conflict within the, the church body at a national level as, as we have, have in our, our state and national politics here in America. And I thought to myself, this doesn't seem right. This is the body of Christ. And let me tell you, politics were running hot that year. There were some real hot button issues that year. The church had just elected its first indigenous uh, moderator, the right reverend, now the very reverend, uh, Stan Mackay, the church was debating whether they should produce a liturgies for same-sex marriages that year. But you know what the real hot-button issue was that year? <laughs> they were debating creating a new hymn book. <laughs> you know, you can deal with a lot of different political issues, but you don't change the hymns very easily. There was a lot of politics, and I remember coming into the arena each morning, and there was like division, and there was like so many voices, hundreds and hundreds of people doing the politics of the church, lobbying one another. Did they fix that motion? And are you going to vote this way on this motion? And it was just like a chaos. Thankfully, we began every day with worship. And I remember the way the worship leaders that year began worship. Everybody's buzzing about in this arena. And the worship leaders came up to the platform. They, they didn't do this. Would you all please take your seats? We're going to begin with worship now. Which would have just been adding to the noise, adding to the cacophony in that arena that day, right? No, the worship leaders simply walked up onto the platform and very, very quietly began singing the words of Psalm 46.10. Be still, be still, be still and know that I am God, for I am exalted in the nations and on earth. Be still and know that I am God. And slowly, but surely, every person, one by one, began to become quiet and still. And as the worship leader sang it again, people started joining in. Be still, be still, be still and know that I am God, for I am exalted in the nations and on earth. Be still and know that I am God. And all that noise, and all those voices, and all that misinformation and disinformation and division and tension and stress within the body of Christ was settled down and the church became the church. We became one in the body of Christ in our stillness, in our listening for the voice of the Good Shepherd. Until we were all singing it together, a room full of 800 delegates and media people and all sorts of folks. And so I'm going to ask you to sing it with me right now. Be still, be still. Be still and know that I am God, for I am exalted in nations and on earth. Be still and know that I am God. Friends, I don't believe Christ is asking us to plug our ears. I don't think he's asking us to quit listening to the world around us. To be a Christian is to be in conversation 
with the world around us. The world that God loves so much that God gave us Jesus, that whoever believed in Jesus would not ha perish but would have eternal life. No, I don't think Jesus is asking us to stop being in conversation with the world. But I do think that Jesus is reminding us to be in conversation with God, to be still, to practice some conscious listening for the Word of God in our lives. The Good Shepherd's still speaking. One might ask if we're still listening. God gave us two ears, one mouth. Do the math. Praise be to God. Amen. Amen.